One is Pentecostal theology teaches that one God, our only true God, is the Father, also became one man as a distinct human being. Prominent oneness theologians affirm that our one God, the Father, also became one man as our Lord Jesus Christ. The word Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah. God became one man as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. There's not two God persons or three God persons here. There's only one God, our Heavenly Father, who also became a human person, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. One of theologian Dr. David Bernard wrote in his article entitled, The Mediator Between God and Men, and I quote, God himself came into this world as a human being. Obviously, he meant that God, the Father himself, came into this world as a human being. Dr. Bernard did not say that God the Father came into this world as God the Father. David Bernard clearly said that God the Father came into this world as a human being. For one God person, the Father, also came into this world as a distinct human person, the Son of God. So there is an ontological distinction between God as God, our Heavenly Father outside the Incarnation, and Emmanuel, God with us as a man, God with us as a genuine human person inside the Incarnation. At approximately 23 minutes and 45 seconds into David Bernard's debate with Robert Morey, a Trinitarian apologist, Dr. Robert Morey, Brother David Bernard stated, and I quote, When we speak of Jesus conversing with the Father, it is understandable that Jesus was speaking as an authentic human being. Now here Dr. Bernard doesn't say that Jesus was speaking or praying as God the Father. He said Jesus was speaking as an authentic human being, praying to the Father as one human person, one human being, praying to God the Father's being, because God the Father also became a human being. John 5, 26 clearly says, Jesus speaking, as the Father has life in himself, a divine life in himself, so also has he granted the Son life in himself. The human life of the Son of God was granted by God because God also became a true human son. So since God is not ontologically a man, Numbers 23, 19 says that God is not a man nor a son of man, we know that when God became a man, he became distinct ontologically by entering into the confines of human limitations. This explains why Jesus had to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, Luke 2, 52. This explains why Jesus did not know all things in Mark 13, 32. He did not know the day or the hour of his own second coming. So Jesus could not be God the Father with us as God. If that were the case, then Jesus as God the Father was tempted of evil. That couldn't be the case. Even Trinitarian theologians acknowledge that Jesus could not be tempted as God because God became a man. This is the same belief that one as Pentecostal theologians believe because we believe that God became a man just like the Trinitarian theologians believe that God became a man. Except we believe that the only true God is our Heavenly Father. Trinitarians believe at a distinct God the Son became a man. At 23 minutes and 13 seconds into the same debate, Dr. Bernard said that the prayers of Jesus were always in the context of a real human life. Then at approximately 24 minutes and 30 seconds, David Bernard said, You must understand that it was as a real human being that he submitted his will to God. End quote. Here we find that Dr. Bernard stated that Jesus as a real human being had a real human will who submitted that human will to God. So, one this Pentecostal theology does not teach that Jesus' will was the will of God the Father as God the Father. One is Pentecostal theology teaches that the one divine will of our Heavenly Father also became a human being with a human will. Now that human will was God's new mode of existence with us as a man with a human will, but not 
as God with us, as God with a divine will. There's an ontological distinction between the Father and the Son. And most Trinitarian apologists and those who mock one as Pentecostal theology erroneously believe that we're saying that Jesus prayed and Jesus had a will of God the Father. And God the Father prayed to God the Father. And, and God the Father will uh, here on the earth as a man was God the Father's will up in heaven too. And, and that doesn't make any sense. That's not what one as Pentecostal theology teaches. One as theologian J.L. Hall wrote in his article in the Pentecostal Herald, and I quote, Did Jesus pray to himself? No, not when we understand that Jesus was both God and man. In his deity, Jesus did not pray, for God does not need to pray to anyone. As a man, Jesus prayed to God, not to his humanity. He did not pray to himself as humanity, but to the one true God, to the same God who dwelled in his humanity, and who also inhabits the universe. Brother Hall went on to write in the same publication, Biblical facts reveal that Jesus lived as an authentic human being. Not God the Father with us as God the Father, but he lived with us as an authentic human being, that he did not merely assume the appearance of flesh. In other words, Jesus Christ is not just God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ also is God who became an authentic human being. That's exactly what Hebrews 2.17 says. The God who partook of flesh and blood to share in our humanity was made fully human in every way, so much so that we can be called his brethren. Hebrews 2.17 Therefore, we should not be surprised, but the whole goes on to write, we should not be surprised that he prayed to God, seeking strength, guidance, and assurance. Moreover, we should not be surprised that Jesus had a will distinct from God. That he was truly human in spirit and soul. That he possessed a self-awareness of his humanity. Jesus' prayers to God the Father came from his human life. A distinct human life. Again, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son life in himself. Now, uh, God the Son couldn't be granted life in himself. Obviously, the Son of God is the man who was born at Bethlehem, conceived in the Virgin Mary as a human life, distinct from God the Father in himself. So, Brother Hall goes on to say, to write, his prayers to God the Father came from his human life, from the incarnation. In other words, at the very moment of the conception, the supernatural conception in the Virgin, that's when the human life of the Son was granted by the Father, John 5, 26. Brother Hall goes on to write, His prayers were not those of one divine person to another divine person, but those of an authentic human praying to the one true God. Prayer is based on an inferior being in supplication before a superior being. If the one praying is equal in power and authority to the one to whom he is praying, there is no genuine prayer. And Quote. So here we find that oneness Pentecostal theologians teach that God, the one true God, also became a distinct human being with an authentic human life in which he had a will and had the capacity to pray and be tempted of evil. God as God does not pray to God. God as God is not tempted of evil. So we find that Jesus prayed in an authentic human life. Not as God's will praying to God will number one, or God will number two praying to God will number one. That is completely ridiculous, and that's not what one as Pentecostals believe. One as theology clearly teaches that God became a genuine human being in the incarnation through the Virgin, who lived as an authentic human being, a human person, who prayed to God the Father's divine person. Because only the one true God, the Father, who is omnipresent, never had to leave heaven, could also come into the world as his own arm revealed, the arm of Yahweh revealed, to become a distinct man with a distinct human life in himself, with a human consciousness, a human mind and will. Jesus' prayers could not have been through a divine conscious person number two praying to divine conscious person number one. That makes no sense whatsoever because God doesn't pray ontologically. He cannot in his nature pray to anyone. Here we see the prayers of Jesus were from his complete human nature. 
This explains the prayers and temptations of Jesus Christ as a true man living among men. Therefore, oneness theologians acknowledge that Jesus Christ is both God Almighty as to his true divine identity, fully man, as to his true human identity, because God himself became a man within the Hebrew virgin. Oneness author Talmadge French affirmed that God became a man in the incarnation through the virgin. At 9.40 into Dr. Talmadge French's lecture on oneness Pentecostalism and Global Perspective, Dr. Talmadge French said, and I quote, How did God become a man and yet remain God? How is God the Father, Son, and Spirit, and yet one God? It is an awesome revelation, end quote. Here we find that Dr. Talmadge French stated, that God became a single man in the Incarnation through the Virgin, yet remained God up in the heavens. He still remained God, because God's divine person also became a human person. In other words, God can be the Father outside the Incarnation, the Son inside the Incarnation, and the Spirit, because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, is God's Spirit in action or emanation from His throne in heaven. Yet all three manifestations of that God are the same God. Our one true God is our Heavenly Father, and the Son of God and the Spirit of God are manifestations of the face of the Father. Because one God is our only true God, the Father. Jesus prayed in John 17, 3, Holy Father. He was praying to the Father, and he said, You are the only true God. Jesus Christ is God because he is the manifestation of the face of the Father with us in genuine and full human existence. William Chalfant is a respected oneness author who wrote the following in a critique of Bible writers' theology. And I quote, If Jesus Christ is not God Almighty, God the Father, then he is not able to save us, but he is. On the other hand, if Jesus of Nazareth is not the true Son of Mary and a genuine human being descended from David and Abraham, then he cannot be our Redeemer and our sacrifice for sins. To deny his wonderful divinity, as God the Father, is to rob him of his rightful glory. On the other hand, to deny his genuine humanity is to rob us of our blood sacrifice, who hung in our place on the old rugged cross. If he is not one of us, then we do not have a true mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 states, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. If he is not true Anthropos and true God, then our faith is in vain. But it is not in vain, because he stood in my place. End quote. Again, Brother William Chalfant, a oneness scholar, very educated, he clearly stated that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man, and that Jesus Christ is God incarnate as a genuine human being. This is what Oneness Pentecostal Theology teaches. Oneness theologian Jason Dool wrote that, and I quote, The duality of wills are not internal to Christ between his two natures, but external to Christ between God's two modes of existence, as God, Father, as man, Son, Jesus. There is only one divine person, but that one divine person is willing in both a divine manner as the Father and in a human manner as the Son. In God's divine manner of existence as the Father, God wills exclusively in a divine manner. While in God's human manner of existence as the Son of God, He wills exclusively in a human manner. So here we have the Father, outside the Incarnation, wills in a divine manner, and the Son of God, inside the Incarnation, exclusively wills in a human manner. Christ is God's human manner of existence, and that mode of existence wills exclusively according to what he is, i.e. man. So God as man wills, prays, speaks, thinks, acts exclusively as God with us as a man. But God's manner of existence outside the incarnation wills exclusively in his divine will as God the Father. So one is Pentecostal theology teaches the ontological distinctions between God the Father and God's new mode of existence as a human son. For God became a man, he became a son. 
One of this author, Dr. Daniel Seagraves, wrote that Jesus is God manifest in genuine and full human existence. And I quote, Everything that Jesus did and said, he did and said as who he was. God manifest in genuine and full human existence. He didn't say some things. He said everything that Jesus did and said. He did and said as who he was, God manifest in genuine and full human existence. So Jesus Christ didn't sometimes speak as the Father and then shift his will and go, I have, now I have the human will of the Son. Now I'm speaking with my divine will as the Father. No, he didn't speak with two wills. He spoke with one human will and one human consciousness with a divine awareness through revelation from his Father of his true identity as Emmanuel, God manifest in the flesh, God with us as a true human being. One of his theology clearly teaches that God became a genuine human being in the incarnation through the Virgin who lived an authentic human life as an authentic human being. This explains the prayers and temptations of Jesus Christ as a true man living among men. Therefore, one of his theologians acknowledge that Jesus Christ is both God Almighty as to his true divine identity and fully man as to his true human identity because God himself became a man within the Hebrew virgin. The oneness theological position does not teach that Jesus ever prayed to the Father as the Father, as our position affirms that Jesus prayed and submitted his human will to the Father as a real human being. Hence, God the Father was able to operate as the unchangeable God outside the incarnation with only one divine will, only one divine consciousness, while the child born and son given is God the Father with us as an authentic human being who prayed in the context of a real human life with a real human will. Thus we have one divine God person as the Father and one mediator between that God person and all humanity, the man Christ Jesus. For the only true God also became an authentic human being as a human person because one person as one person cannot mediate or interact with himself. One of theology affirms that the one God who is our Heavenly Father also became a distinct human being through the incarnation in the Virgin. When God the Father's substance of being, hypostasis, became a man as a fully complete human being, the new human existence of the Son of God was granted life in himself. The Greek word didymi means given or granted. The Greek word for life, zoe, means life. So the text cannot be altered here. The Greek text clearly states that the human existence of the Son of God was granted or given life in himself. God as God can't be granted or given life in himself. So we know that it's the Son of God, the man Christ Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, are incarnational titles for the man Christ Jesus, who was given life in himself within the incarnation. While the divine life of the Father retained his immutable life in himself outside of the incarnation, because God as God cannot vacate heaven, God as God can't leave heaven or lose his divine attributes. I am Yahweh, I change not. Hence, Jesus is not God the Father with us as God the Father, he is God the Father's new human mode of existence, living with us as a genuine human being. Trinitarians usually laugh and ridicule our position before taking the time to honestly examine what we want as Pentecostals really believe. Trinitarian apologists often distort the oneness position. On YouTube, I'm going to, by God's grace, make a response to this YouTube video produced by Pastor Stephen Anderson. Trinitarian apologist Stephen Anderson ridicules oneness Pentecostal theology by showing the distinction between the Father's divine will and the Son's distinct human will. Yet Pastor Steve Anderson's comments only support oneness theology as we believe that God the Father became a true human being in the Incarnation through the Virgin with a distinct human will and a distinct authentic human life in himself. Let us play the video clip from 735 to 8.30 in Steve Anderson's video entitled, Pentecostal Oneness Doctrine Debunked. Because the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. That sounds like there's a big distinction there. But look at verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. 
as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. That shows right there that the will of the Father is different than the will of the Son. What the Son wants to do is not the same as what the Father wants to do. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Not my will, but thine be done. Why? Because there's a difference there in what the son would want to do versus the father has a will and he has obedience to the father and he submits himself to the will of the father because there's a chain of command there. Pastor Stephen Anderson's own words show that he has a distorted view about oneness Pentecostal theology. He believes that we are affirming that Jesus Christ is God the Father incarnate with us as God the Father, rather than God the Father himself who became a man, came into this world as a human being. Dr. Bernard clearly wrote in his article entitled, The Mediator Between God and Men, that God, our Heavenly Father himself, came into this world as a human being. The Trinitarian position that one God person's will could possibly oppose another God person's will, and that one God person could eternally subordinate himself to another God person in an alleged chain of command, these are the words of Pastor Steve Anderson, a chain of command in the Godhead, contradicts the words of inspired scripture. For no Trinitarian can cite a single Bible verse to show that God as God has more than one divine will. Or that God, as God, has a chain of command among three alleged co-equally distinct divine persons. If God has a chain of command within himself as three distinct divine persons, then we don't have one true God anymore. We have polytheism. We have diatheism and tritheism. Because God, as God, throughout the Hebrew Bible, even in the New Testament, has only one divine will. He's only one divine person. But when God became a man with a distinct human will, Trinitarians misunderstand the incarnation. They get it wrong. They pervert the incarnation. And they, they're preaching another Jesus. They're preaching a God, the Son Jesus, who is not that true God who came to save us. He's another true God. I, mean, I know that's not the way Trinitarians like to say it, but that's what they're really saying. By saying that God has three divine minds, three divine wills, three divine persons, with each person having his own distinct consciousness, God with more than one consciousness, God with more than one will, and that will of God number two person could potentially disagree with God number one person? Could we have an argument among the Godhead and that the three God persons could disagree with themselves? That's ridiculous. God has never spoken of as, as a they, there, or them. God has never spoken of as more than one divine person. We have one God person who became one human person. Hebrews 1.3 is very clear. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the brightness of Apagasma, the reflected brightness of his, the Father's glory, and the express image of his, the Father's person, with a life in himself that was granted by God the Father by becoming a human person. Knowledgeable oneness theologians do not affirm that Jesus as a son is literally God the Father with us as God the Father. If Jesus was just God the Father thrust into an external shell of human flesh, then he could not have prayed. He could not have been tempted of the devil. He had to have a true human spirit, a true human will, who prayed to the Father. So, one as Pentecostals with proper teaching and proper knowledge understand that Jesus Christ is not literally God the Father with us as God the Father, because the scriptures teach that God the Father became a man in the incarnation of the Virgin as a genuine human being, a genuine human son. The scripture says in Hebrews 2.17, that he was made like unto his brethren, the King James Version. The Greek word for like means exactly like all human beings are made. He is the second Adam because he was made so fully human in every way that he could be called the second Adam and we could be called his brethren. I ascend to my God and your God. And it's very clear in, Col in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29-30, that he's the firstborn among many brethren. He's, Jesus Christ is so fully and completely human that we can be called his brethren. Knowledgeable wonder theologians do not start with Jesus as a son because the son is the man who had his beginning by his virgin conception and birth. Hence, 
God did not appear as a son until the fullness of time had come. Therefore, God did not appear or manifest himself as a living son anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. Wonders theologians affirm that the Father alone is the only true God, and that the Son and Spirit are manifestations of the Father himself. Some Trinitarian apologists like Dr. Edward Delcor and Mr. Louis Reyes often confuse oneness theology with Nestorianism when they allege that we have to decide when Jesus is speaking as the Father or Son. Nestorius taught that Jesus spoke and acted as two persons within one body, while oneness modalism teaches that God became a true man in the incarnation through the Virgin who could only act and speak in his human mode of consciousness. Hence, knowledgeable oneness theologians know that we do not have to decide when Jesus is speaking as Father or Son because Jesus only spoke as one human person with only one human mind, one human consciousness, and one human will. He didn't speak with a divine will, praying to the divine will of God the Father. He spoke out of a human consciousness with a human will. Oneness modalism teaches that God as God is the Father, who only has one divine will outside of the Incarnation, while Jesus is God with us as a man, who only has one human will inside of the Incarnation. Hence, God as God is the Father's omnipresent Holy Spirit outside of the Incarnation, and God as man is the Father's Holy Spirit inside the Incarnation as a true human Son. When Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father, and before Abraham was, I am, he spoke as who he was, God manifest in genuine and full human existence, because he had a divine awareness of his true identity, which was revealed to him by his Father. One as author Dr. Daniel Seagraves wrote, and I quote, Everything that Jesus did and said, he did and said as who he was, God manifest in genuine and full human existence. Dr. Seagraves has written 15 books in print and is currently a professor of biblical studies at Urshan Graduate School of Theology, endorsed by David Bernard himself. Why would Dr. Seagraves, who teaches at the most advanced UPC Bible College, say that everything that Jesus did and said, he didn't say some things, he said everything that Jesus did and said, he did as who he was, God manifest in genuine and full human existence. So Jesus spoke as a genuine human being, as God with us in genuine and full human existence. The oneness position clearly teaches that everything Jesus said was as God manifest in genuine and full human existence, rather than as God the Father's existence outside of the Incarnation. Therefore, the common Trinitarian polemic against oneness theology is based upon the erroneous assumption that we believe Jesus spoke as God the Father rather than our belief that everything that Jesus said was in his genuine and full human existence. While many oneness believers may say that Jesus spoke as two persons in one body, which is really Nestorianism, this is not the true scriptural or historic position of oneness modalism. Modalism teaches that God became a man in the incarnation through the Virgin. He modally operated by becoming a son. Jesus didn't sometimes speak as the Father and other times speak as the Son. That would be a Nestorian view, a Nestorian slant. I acknowledge that many oneness believers have erroneous views, just like Trinitarian apologist James White has repeatedly stated that most Trinitarians are not properly taught about theology, and they come up with all kinds of bizarre statements. Well, I would say the same thing is true among oneness Pentecostals. We need to be taught proper oneness theology, and I will acknowledge that many, uh, even oneness theologians, sometimes say things that are incorrect. Well, we have the same problem here among the Trinitarians, because Trinitarian theologian Dr. R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul, had said that the those who hold the canonic view that God left heaven, a God the Son left heaven and became a man, is heresy. <laughs> and we know a lot of Trinitarian theologians are teaching that. A lot of Trinitarian pastors, even some of the those who I debated with, that are knowledgeable and scholarly, 
have held the view that God the Son left heaven to become a man, lost his omnipresence, in contradiction to inspired scripture like Malachi 3, 6, where God does not change his divine attributes. I am Yahweh, I change not. Jesus Christ the same as to his deity, yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. So many Trinitarians, in fact, most lay trinitarians i speak with they almost all say that a god the son left heaven and prayed to his father because god the son became a human god the son and so that explains the prayers of jesus we've got two divine persons praying to the father praying one divine person praying as the man to the father and uh the divine god the son had left heaven see but uh, that is called heresy by a lot of knowledgeable trinitarian theologians so that position also that a heavenly God the Son retain his immutable divine attributes would also have the idea of a heavenly God the Son up in heaven and an earthly son who could act independently as an earthly human son while a heavenly God the Son could act independently in heaven as divine God the Son who never changed. So that sounds like two son persons as well. Like uh, a lot of people accuse one as Pentecostal, well then you got two fa you got two father persons. You got God the Father up in heaven as God the Father, and then you got God the Father down here as a son, as a distinct human person. So you got two God the Father persons. Well, not true. We don't say that God the Father has two persons, but we have one God the Father who remained the same as God in His immutable divine attributes. But God the Father also could become a distinct man because of his divine attribute of omnipresence. He could become one distinct human being while God the Father never had to leave heaven. Now, created beings such as angels and men, an angel can't come down from heaven and yet stay up in heaven at the same time. That can't happen. But only the omnipresent God could become a man as the arm of Yahweh himself revealed while simultaneously retaining his distinct immutable divine attributes. I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. Isaiah 46, 9. Since Jesus Christ exemplified the many of the attributes of God, he was like God in his attributes. For instance, he raised his own body from death. John 2, 19. God can raise people from the dead, but men cannot raise themselves from the dead. So Jesus displayed the attributes of God. Jesus said in John chapter 10, 37, 38, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you don't believe in me, believe in the works, that you may know that the Father is in me. Then Jesus said, and I in him, because he was in union with his Father. His humanity was one with the Father. Because there's unity between the Father and the Son, because God also became a man. And there also is a unity with the Father and the Son, because the Son as a man was always in harmony with the will of God the Father, just like we are. So there's two aspects to oneness there in uh, John chapter 10. But uh, it's very clear that Jesus Christ did the works of God the Father himself. Since God said, I am God and there's none like me, that means Jesus being like God the Father did the works of God the Father. He didn't do the works of a God the Son here. He did the works of God the Father according to John 10, 37, 38. That means by doing the works of God the Father, that means he is the divine identity of God the Father himself who entered into a new mode of existence as a genuine human being. That's why Jesus could say in John 12, verse 44, 45, that to see him was to see the Father. He that believes in me doesn't believe in me, but the one who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. So to see Jesus is to see the Father. He didn't say to see me is to see God the Son and also to see my Father and also to see the Holy Spirit. He said to see me is to see the divine person called God the Father with us as a genuine human person. To see him and to believe in him is to believe on that God. He didn't claim any divine dignity as another distinct God person beside the Father. Therefore, there can only be one true God, the Father, who also became a true man in the incarnation to the Virgin as one God person who became one man person. We do not teach Nestorianism. Those one of Pentecostals out there that are teaching a form of Nestorianism are wrong. Jesus didn't sometimes speak as the Father, other times speak as the Son. He spoke with a human conscience, with a knowledge of his true divine identity, but he spoke as a man, as a fully complete human being in the incarnation through the Virgin. He, just like he was tempted as a man, so he prayed as a man. 
those Trinitarians out there that are saying that we believe that Jesus prayed to the Father as the Father and that Jesus' human actions that show a distinction between the Father and the Son to try to prove a trinity of three divine persons, they're incorrect because the oneness theology teaches that God became a man and this is what we'd expect. If God became a man, he had to have a God to whom he prayed. If God became a man, a true human being, he had to have the capacity to be tempted of evil. He had to have the capacity to be led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of evil. Jesus was so fully, completely human. Jesus said in John 8, 42, that I did not come of myself, but he sent me. Now, just like all human beings do not have a, an ability to decide whether they're going to come into this world, none of us could choose that we came into this world. In his human consciousness, as a true human person, he said, I did not come of myself, but he, the Father, sent me. So Jesus Christ was so fully human in his human consciousness that he said he didn't even come of himself, but the Father sent him. Likewise, in John 5.30, Jesus said, I can do nothing by myself. I judge only as I hear from him. Jesus only judged as he heard from the Father. He said, I can do nothing by myself. The ontological distinction between the Father and the Son is affirmed by one as Pentecostal theology. We believe that God became a distinct human being in the incarnation of the Virgin with a distinct human life in himself, as it says in John 5, 26, and that new human life, that new human mode of existence of God the Father had to have been so fully human that we be, can be called his brethren and that human being, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, had to have had a God to whom he prayed. He said, I ascend to my God and your God. Jesus Christ is truly and fully a human being who prayed to his Father. But that does not destroy the deity of Jesus Christ, which Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He clearly identified himself as the mighty God and everlasting Father who did the works of God the Father, but not God with us as God, but Emmanuel, God with us as a true man in the incarnation through the Virgin. God bless you all in Jesus' name. For more weekly videos, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel or visit us on the web at apostolicchristianfaith.com. Lord bless.